All right, Jeff, I think we're good. Okay, everyone, we're going to get started. Maybe a couple minutes early, but I also have no idea how long this talk's going to take. Uh, this is a very different presentation style, which I'll get into. So computer security, we know it's all pretty miserable right now. Um, apologists will often say, oh, well, hey, it's a new industry. And in reality, that's just not the case. Um, maybe compared to like pyramids and fire, sure, computers are new. But uh, compared to the modern car industry, like the Model T in 1908, we got that beat. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So the rules. Um, <laughs> if you have questions, please wait till the end. If I'm wrong about something, go ahead and interrupt me. Uh, we'll resolve it real quick. You're wrong. Huh? Usually, yeah. Um, those familiar with my uh, my past talks have noticed this uh, this presentation is very different for me. And uh, I got some inspiration from these fine gentlemen, Alex Hutton, uh, Chris Nickerson, and Skylar Town. Uh, they're more storytellers, and that's what I'm going to try to do today. Uh, since this is a change in presentation style, that also means you're my guinea pigs. Um, if for some reason I can't adapt to this style, I can go back to my old one, which is bullet points and charts and a bunch of boring shit, right? So a quick word of warning. If you know me, uh, just consider my entire being a trigger word. Uh, if you've been in the industry, you'll know what that means, and since you've been warned, get the hell out. If not, you know, suffer. So who am I? I like small misunderstood creatures. Uh, it's not very relevant, but that is zesty. Um, I collect things. I always have. I've always been a collector, even as a kid. Erasers, pencils, you name it, whatever. And that's relevant because right now I collect vulnerabilities. Uh, like some people collect, I don't know, stamps, coins, or in the case of uh, Space Road back there, STDs. Uh, <laughs> I got all the best ones from you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, uh, 111 years, even though the title said 110, we actually flipped into the, the 111th year when I was doing this presentation. Um, that's not a typo. That's not tequila speaking. That's actually a real figure, and I'll show you why. So we're going to start out uh, by what did I do to prepare for this talk. I read some articles, some fascinating ones out there. I read some uh, kind of obscure papers about the history of vulnerabilities, also a lot of fun reading. Uh, I sent mail to old people and said, hey, Back in the day, what were the vulnerabilities like? Older people. Uh, I read some books. These are all from uh, 1973 or so. So yes, in 1973, we had books on computer security, believe it or not. Amazon probably thinks I'm a freak since I ordered about 10 of these in a row. Like, this guy's a little behind the times. So uh, hopefully this isn't too depressing. Um, it's going to be depressing at the start. And then hopefully by the end, you're going to be a little happier and you're going to realize, wait a minute, if I have a better history, maybe I can do my job a little better. Maybe I can make a little more change. Because we all know how bad things are right now. And that really does summarize not only the state of security, but the industry. There's a common saying uh, in history, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. George Santayana. Uh, that was also attributed later to just about everyone, including Shepard, Burke, Vonnegut, and Jesse Ventura. Yeah, seriously, Google it. Okay, enough intro. So when we talk about vulnerability history, uh, we have to kind of pick a start date, and that's going to be a little bit arbitrary, because you can argue that computers go back further. Oh, the abacus, that was a computer. No, we're going to start uh, what I, actually, about 10 years ago, I would have thought maybe the 60s. And then about five years ago in my work, I realized, no, maybe it was the 50s. And then in the past few years, I realized that the 1900s is a better place to start. We're going to start with the Marconi Wireless Telegraph. This bad boy was invented leading up to 1903. Like you can imagine, a wireless telegraph. So instead of over the wires, through the airwaves. What kind of technology do we use today that does the same thing? Yeah. So um, this was a significant advance in uh, communications technology at the time. The primary creator was uh, Marconi, and he had his assistants uh, Fleming and Block, and poor Block. He apparently is not even important enough to get a Wikipedia page or a picture, which is unfortunate. So Marconi, like <coughs> most security vendors today, he said his device was secure and that messages were private. He bragged to the media, I can tune my instruments so that no other instrument that is not similarly tuned can tap my messages. If you heard that from a vendor today, what would you say? <laughs> yeah. So to show off the new device, he set up a public demonstration in the theater. 
Marconi himself was in Cornwall, 300 miles away. So he's going to really show off this in a spectacular fashion. Uh, the audience, everyone and his assistants were in the theater. And uh, right before they were supposed to receive this message, there was a faint ticking sound. Just tick, 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 tick. And uh, it wasn't Marconi that figured it out. It wasn't Fleming. It was poor old Block. Block was the smart one. He was like the adjunct professor. Gets paid jack shit, but actually knows what he's doing, right? <laughs> so he's like, wait a minute. That ticking, it sounds familiar. That's Morse code. And he realized right then that the signal, whatever was causing it, was strong enough to come through the walls and to resonate off one of the brass lanterns. And so he started listening. He's like, what is that, what is that Morse code? One word, over and over. Rats. 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 Just over and over. So Marconi wasn't very thrilled about this. Um, and it came to light. Block figured out that someone had actually spoofed the signal, sent it into the theater, and disrupted the whole presentation. Of course, Marconi looked like a jackass. Um, and even more so afterwards, when he was asked about it, he says, I will not demonstrate to any man who throws doubt upon the system. Yeah, still a jackass. <laughs> so even worse, his main man Fleming, pictured later in life, uh, he wasn't so rigid. He was pissed off. He went to uh, the London, or the Times of London, dubbing the hack scientific hooliganism, which is an awesome term. I think we need to adopt that instead of hacking. The media can have a field day with that. Um, so uh, he calls it an outrage against the traditions of the royal institution. Uh, like vendors today, that isn't a vulnerability. Um, then he asked the newspaper for help identifying the culprit. He's like, I want to find out who did this to us. Four days later, he got what he wanted when the culprit wrote an open letter to the, the same publication and said, yeah, I did that. I'm awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Meet Masculine. It's a great name, too, yeah. So a stage magician and an inventor, he decided to troll Marconi, uh, show him that his notions of private were very private. Uh, so basically, you arguably have the world's first hacker. Pretty cool, right? Um, and like today's, he was flexing his EP back then. So Marconi's patented technology uh, for broadcasting on precise wavelengths uh, was kind of shattered. But the story goes deeper. So there's a few articles about this, and if you kind of read between the lines, you figure out that Masculine was actually hired by the Eastern Telegraph Company uh, for a year before the incident, specifically to spy on Marconi. So not only did he get to piss all over Marconi, he got paid to do it. That's exactly what we do. Um, the brilliant part, though, is that he actually wrote an article in The Electrician in 1902, at least six months before he did this hack, and Marconi never saw it, never checked his references, never did his research. So yeah, he, uh, he kind of deserved what he got, I think. But the lesson is if you say it's secure or private, you might want to verify it first. So that goes into the, uh, the next step, World War II. Um, 1930s and 40s, uh, the next one is largely centered around that. Several countries had developed or uh, used electromechanical rotor cipher machines. Who knows what those are? Anyone? Oh, yeah. Some historians here, okay. Uh, the most famous was? Enigma. Enigma. There we go. Uh, German engineer Arthur Scherbius. Uh, early models were used in the 20s and later models all the way into the 40s. That's the Enigma. Uh, there's even a movie. Was it U571? Yep. Yeah, Matt McConaughey, submarine. Yeah, anyway, uh, Enigma's kind of the, the focal point of that one. So anyway, uh, in 1932, the encryption for this bad boy was cracked by uh, Rajewski in Poland. And over the coming years, subsequent models would fall left and right. And it would be broken by other people. So very quickly, well, relatively speaking, over several years, this thing went from, oh, ultra secure to, yeah, if you have some paper and pen. Um, what most people don't realize is that Enigma is one of many. Anyone know what this is? From Japan? If I can pronounce this, the Oban Injiki, uh, which means alphabetical typewriter 97, or as it was known back then, purple. Yeah, who, who said purple? Awesome. Okay, and the intercepts were called? Magic. Awesome. So this was actually used for diplomatic, not military. Um, in 1940, the break of Japan's purple by an SIS team. Uh, after that, so Mr. History, 
Siemens uh, T52 Geheimschreiber. Sound familiar? I saw it yesterday. <laughs> Want to come up here? <laughs> okay, codenamed Sturgeon in 1940, crafted by the Swedes. So what we're seeing is a pattern. Everyone's coming out with these new machines. Hey, we have great encryption. This is perfect. We can talk privately, securely. But in each case, they fell one by one. And usually, what was the number one factor that led to it? Human error. They used the same cipher too many times. They didn't rotate the, the wheels. Something human-related caused the problems. This is the Lorenz, uh, initially cracked in 1942, a.k.a. Tunny. I like how all the, uh, the encryption here gets these you know, fun names, which is good because I can't pronounce all this other crap. Um, so we're going to end on this one for a reason. Uh, we can thank this little beauty. What did this one do for us that none of the others did? It led to the first digital computer, which was? Colossus. Yes. I was waiting for half of you to say the ENIAC. Because if you go to any of these like geeks that drink trivia or whatever, they always say, oh, the first digital computer is the ENIAC. No, it was the Colossus. The Colossus was specifically built to uh, crack that encryption. That's the Colossus, nine feet high, 16 feet long, 10 feet wide, 5,500 watts of power, uh, same computing power as your phone. <laughs> Predates the ENIAC. Um, the difference is the uh, Colossus was a very specific machine. It was designed to crack encryption. The ENIAC was the first general purpose one. So three years later, that's the distinction. Anyway, technicalities. Who recognizes these criminals? Laws and Jobs. Laws and Jobs, yeah. So this is our lead in into the 1950s, the rise of the phone freaks. Who here has ever made a free phone call before, say, 1990? Awesome. Okay, yeah, a bunch of old people in here. I like this. <laughs> so um, many forget that phone switches are just electromechanical machines that were replaced by big digital computers. And in 1955, the Western Electric Lab's Panel Machine Switching System, the MSS, had a ring forward spoofing or ring forward signal spoofing weakness. Uh, basically, predates the blue box. So before the blue box, people figured out how to make free phone calls on this thing. Um, I won't go into all the details on that one. Western Electric Labs crossbar switch and the general telephone Stroger step-by-step. -step. So at this time, uh, the exploit was called the black box. Who remembers the black box? Yeah, a few of you read about that one. So this isn't the black box from the late 70s or actually late 80s. This is the original black box. Um, basically a race condition where the phone went on and off the hook fast enough the billing system wouldn't kick in. So anyone with a phone that knew this, basically just hang up, pick up a few times, make a phone call, and there's a good chance they're not going to get billed. This is where we start to learn uh, user input is bad. <laughs> so in 1960, the Western Electric Lab's number 4A crossbar. So yeah, every time they came out with a new one, new ways were invented to abuse it, which is great. Uh, this one gave us the infamous blue box. 2600 tone, or the 7th octave E. Uh, blow that down the line, you could trick the remote switch into thinking the trunk is idle and essentially get a free call off of it. Blue boxes were the most well-known of the freaking days. You have a couple of digital examples and, oh look, toys. Certain toys would actually reproduce the right signal. Have a crunch. Hmm? Have a crunch. They had the cereal with the whistle came in the box. Oh, yes. Captain, Captain Crunch. crunch. Famous with that, yeah. Whistle, that's uh, the one up top, I believe. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, long before that, the Davy Crockett's uh, bird call flute. Awesome. It had the right warble that would actually do it. Um, so yeah, toys and electronics. And there's a, a book out there, which if you download the presentation, I've got all these notes in it. Anyway, there's a fascinating book on uh, phone history, freaking and everything. Must read. Anyway. So now, computer history that we're a little more familiar with. Um, we know that the Colossus and the ENIAC predated all this, but in the 60s, it brought us real multi-user machines. These are ones were primarily in universities. Um, this is the beginning of everything that you know and still work on today, essentially. And it's not a very exciting decade. There wasn't a whole lot that happened. Um, in 1962 and 5 and 6, the IBM 7094, picture there, uh, it's the first multi-user system I'm aware of that has software vulnerabilities 
that we would still associate with our definition today. Um, you had a user password local disclosure, it's a restriction bypass, a local denial of service, and another bug that uh, the text editor would kind of give you access to the entire password file. <laughs> this is before all that encrypted password stuff that we don't care about, you know. So yeah, these were, like I said, in universities or big businesses, oftentimes anyone could sit down at one of these and work for an hour. They were time sharing systems, you've got your one hour, then get the hell off my machine. Uh, you were audited. Um, so moving forward, a lot of the hacks were centered around how do I get more time on this or how do I use my time and make it look like it came from your account. So just like the 1960s were not so dramatic, the 1970s brought us a world of fun in the vulnerability world. Um, yeah, that actually says Robotron, but it's not the game. Uh, it's a computer made by a German company. Who remembers Oregon Trail? <laughs> yeah. So this puppet had a vulnerability. Anyone ever abused that one? Um, while it was not a multi-user game for the most part, you could play it over uh, TTY or phone lines. Um, it had this little bug where the user could kind of put in, wow, I think I'm going to spend negative $10. And that whole negative integer thing just kind of made them have all the money in the world. <laughs> made it a little easier to get to Oregon. Uh, PDP-10. Who has ever seen, used, looked at one of these in the flesh? Yeah. So these were uh, some of the old mainframes. Some of them are actually still in production use uh, today. It's kind of scary. Uh, primarily at banks, which is more scary. Um, and insurance companies. Yeah. Anyway, so it ran one of two operating systems, either TOPS 10 or 10X. Um, in 1972, it was found to have a timing attack vulnerability that allowed a user to a uh, user to figure out another user's password. So this is getting to be a common theme. And this is a Honeywell uh, DPS-6 running GCOS 3. Anyone know GCOS 3? Yeah, of course the old guy in the back does. Uh, General Comprehensive Operating System from GE. Uh, in 72, two vulnerabilities were found. Another in 79. First was the method to abuse the Fortran compiler, uh, execute commands outside the security envelope. What's going on today in the browser world? It's not about code execution anymore, it's about bypassing the sandbox. There we go, straight back to there. So the same thing on that PDP-10 is now all, or I'm sorry, in the GCOS, uh, is like all hot and exciting again today. Um, they also had a file system module not handling buffers, allowing for the disclosure of arbitrary user credentials, seeing that theme, and unprotected user accessible memory. So, tap the computer's memory, say, what do you got? Dump it all, there you go. And that would kind of plague us forever. <laughs> um, the Tudor programming language was developed for the Play-Doh 4. Look at how streamlined that thing is. <laughs> With a crafted command uh, sent to a remote terminal, you could kind of lock it up, requiring a hard reboot. Sound familiar? Yeah, remote denial of service, fun times. Um, MIT's Honeywell 6180, one of the many computers that ran Multics. So if you're into computer history at all, there's a site called multicians.org. It's all the old Multics people that got together 30, 40 years later and said, we were awesome. <laughs> Here's a bunch of stories about the start of computers. Fascinating reads. Been talking to one of the guys there on and off for, I don't know, seven, eight years. He probably thinks I'm the most demented psychopath ever. I'll mail him and then kind of not reply to him for two years and say, oh yeah, by the way, he has a follow-up. This mail thread, you know, it's like 18 messages over seven years. <laughs> I get busy. Okay. So, um, Multics is the multiplexed information and computing service. Uh, in the 70s, there were at least 10 known vulnerabilities so far. So far. Statistically, uh, we'll go past that. Anyway, so this is the fun story. Um, 1979. Anybody know this guy? Roger Schnell? Shell. Roger Shell. Colonel in the uh, Air Force. He was part of a Tiger team at the Naval Postgraduate School, and his team was contracted to do a pen test. Yes, back in 1979 against Maltics. And so his team went in and said, yep, okay, let's do this. So they kind of broke in, and they kind of completely owned the operating system, and they said, you know, that's not good enough. Let's put a back door in. Cool. So, as part of the pen test, they put a back door. Very few lines of code, 
required a password. That's all. Just a magic password. That's like rootkits that we used back in the early 90s. You know, pretty primitive, but back then that was fancy. So uh, he kind of accidentally did this on the master copy of Multics. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't just the, the target. They kind of moved beyond that. So um, they went to Honeywell and they said, you know, oh, here's the results of the, the pen test. You know, you get to fix all this. Honeywell reads it and they're like, oh, yeah, okay, we can't find this back door. So they explain it in detail. Well, this is what we did. This is the code. This is the password. Honeywell still couldn't find it. How does that work? The manufacturer of an operating system is told there's a back door. They're told what the magic password is, and they still can't find it. So, of course, Honeywell did the next logical thing. Just started distributing the entire operating system with a back door in it. Yeah, so from then on, every single copy of Multics that went out the door was backdoored by our military. Yeah. Sound familiar to anything today? Um, so anyway, uh, Shell, he's kind of a modern or an old day hero in the pen testing world. You should look up to that guy. Um, so yeah, this is a model 91 IBM 360 used at NASA. Uh, the 360 series, IBM 360s. Who's seen any of those in the wild? Yeah? Who's, who knows that they're still used in the wild? Yeah. Again, kind of scary. Um, it ran OS 360, one of three variants. In 74, it was found to have an access restriction bypass in the IMAS P Zap utility. Um, the software is still supported by IBM today, believe it or not, after all these years, known as the Z series. Um, and more fascinating, from 1964 to 2013, 49 years of use. One vulnerability is disclosed. How does that work? So that's one obscure machine and no one uses it. <laughs> so next, PDP-11 at Tottenham College in 1978. Mac Daddy. It's like, okay, I got a computer of women. <laughs> so R RSTS was a multi-user time-sharing OS from uh, DEC, uh, primarily for the PDP-11. In 75, four, vul four vulnerabilities were identified. Good to get denial of service, arbitrary user credential disclosure, getting tired of that one, right? Uh, file disclosure and unspecified remote issue with the login process. Unspecified issue with the login <coughs> process. Who would release that kind of detail? The vendor. Why? Someone bent them over the barrel to do so, probably. And that's straight out of today's, uh, you know, change logs. Fixed security issue. But that's all you get, right? <laughs> So we already have signs, even back then, that someone was practicing modern day disclosure, which is kind of cool, because that predates pretty much everything that we know. Xerox 560, capable of running the CPV operating system, released in 73. Um, in 75, vulnerability was found that allowed a user to bypass the built-in memory protection to elevate privileges. That one sound familiar? Basically, the sandbox bypass again, right? So you're bypassing intended restrictions to elevate privileges. And uh, yeah, once again, why is that so exciting today? Another PDP-11. Uh, anybody recognize those fine gentlemen? Dennis Ritchie and Ken Thompson. Anyone know them? Yeah. Uh, modern day computing heroes, creators of Unix. So any of you that have Unix, any of you that have a fancy MacBook, yeah, it's based on these guys' work. It's kind of cool. Um, Unix is not just an operating system, but a philosophy. It's basis for hundreds of subsequent variants, including a bunch we know and loathe, like Solaris, AIX, HP, IRIX, BSD. 1975, first Unix vulnerability, login process related to array checking. How often do we see array related issues and vulnerabilities today, quite a bit. Six years later, another issue in version six in the SU program. Who knows what SU does? Yeah. Uh, that's arguably when the floodgate opened for Unix vulnerabilities. Based on my study of the history of vulnerabilities, that's kind of the, the tipping point on the Unix side. From there, uh, we have the IBM 370 punch card system. Uh, it ran four different operating systems, depending on what you needed. Two vulnerabilities were found, privilege escalation and password file disclosure. 
So changing topics just a bit, uh, we have the new data seal, MDS algorithm. These days we're familiar with what kind of algorithms? MD5, SHA-1, right? Yeah. So MDS predated all that. It was based on Lucifer, created by Horst Feistel here and his colleagues at IBM. Uh, it was a precursor to DES, Data Encryption Standard, still widely used today. So in 77, NDS was found vulnerable to a slide attack that resulted in a full compromise. Uh, it's one of the very first computer-based algorithms that fell and would kind of start the trend of all of them falling. Um, so next, the kind of another shift. Uh, vulnerabilities were surfing, surfacing enough in the 70s that it started to become a concern. People started saying, wait a minute, you know, this is an issue. At some point, we're going to have to wake up, address this. We're going to have to figure it out. Um, remember back then, there weren't really security people. They were admins. They ran the machine, and they usually spent all their hours making sure it actually ran. So those things would crash all the time, sometimes by students, admins, bugs, literally, insects, yeah. Uh, so by the 80s, vulnerabilities were becoming uh, more prevalent. Someone decided a list should be maintained. And those first lists were basically the early vulnerability databases. Uh, different than today, but the same goal, catalog all the vulns. In the, actually, before the 80s, the original VDB was likely the repaired security bugs in multics list. Some list of bugs in multics. That's why I said earlier we know of at least 10 in multics so far. So uh, that's the list. It's actually now in book form, uh, printed in 1977. It's got zero reviews, and I hope to change that. <laughs> <laughs> So I wanted to get this book and uh, integrate any of the missing vulnerabilities into the database I maintain. So, try to find a library since I couldn't buy it, right? Uh, it's not even in the Amazon marketplace. How does that work? Uh, so, nearest library. Shit. 941 miles. Uh, Google says it exists in one library and it's 941 miles away in California. No one wants to go to California. So, of course, uh, prompts my logical reserve response. Um, <laughs> and fortunately, I now have a line on actually getting the copy next week. Thanks to someone. Raise your hand. Yeah. Someone's actually figured out a way to hook me up with a copy of this, which is going to be great. Yeah. Uh, my fingers are crossed on that one. So, 1980s, more familiar time for us. Computers are smaller. More importantly, they're prevalent. They're starting to pop up all over the place. And after uh, the repaired security bugs in Multics, you have more efforts to catalog vulnerabilities in the 80s. Came in two forms, either mail list that were just discussions. Oh, hey, I found a vulnerability. Or, hey, the system's acting weird. What do you think it is? Or a uh, specific list, kind of like the, the Multics one. So in the 80s, we knew that there were so many bugs, we had to catalog them. And if that's not a warning sign for what was coming, I don't, I don't know what is. And in that theme, uh, after the Multics list in the, mid -late, uh, in the mid to late 80s, we saw other people do the same. Um, the Unix security mailing list in 1984 by Miguel McElhaney, uh, not pictured. Matt Bishop, uh, he had the Unix whole list in 1985. Uh, Al Walker, anyone know Al? Hobbit wrote Netcat. Any of you pen testers use Netcat? Yeah, he's been around a long time. Smart guy. He's also a Prius fan, and I'm not. Um, yeah, he actually did some cross-country crazy drive with his specially hacked Prius and got some obscene amount of like 250 miles to the gallon or something. Anyway, yeah, smart guy. Uh, the Phage Mail List in 88 by Gene Spafford. Anyone know that name? Yeah, Spaff's still kicking around. Um, amusingly, like three days ago, he mails me out of the blue about something else. I was like, hey, I just put your picture in the presentation. He's like... Oh, crap. <laughs> so anyway, it's all positive. Um, and the Zardoz mail list in 89 by Gorsuch. Anybody remember Zardoz? No? No. No. Nope. Nope. <laughs> so yeah, Zardoz was a fun one because that one really kind of got to be a little more, okay, this is the vulnerability, this is how you exploit it, less, oh, well, there is a vulnerability, this is how you fix it, and I'm not going to tell you anything else. Um, in addition to the, the mail list that these guys ran, other people were starting to maintain their own uh, kind of databases, and by that I mean a text file list. Uh, there was the UC Santa Cruz hack method list, which I'm still looking for. 
the Sun Microsystems bug list, which was internal, but supposedly shared outward of Sun back in the day, um, and a Unix known problem list. It's a great name, <laughs> known problems. Okay, yeah, that one sounds like it's gonna have all kinds of juicy stuff. So by this point, there were also dozens of books on security, uh, Unix and VMS boxes all over. Uh, this is the early years of the internet. And back in the day, that was the entire internet. Kind of cool. Yeah, uh, that's 1987, not too long ago. So with these computers all over, what did that do? It gave people access to new things to play with. And because they were networked, either by phone or otherwise, bad guys could get to them. And by bad guys, I mean the actual old school hackers, back when it was kind of a, a cool designation, they were curious. They would get in your system, they would poke around, they would do something, and they'd leave usually. Um, but anyway, that kind of opened a second floodgate. Even the home PCs were starting to run bulletin board systems. How many used to call into BBSs? Yeah, quite a few, figured. Um, they also had their own vulnerabilities. You know, if you were familiar with like WIV and Renegade and all those good BBSs, yeah, each one had different vulnerabilities where you could either bypass file ratios, crash the board, whatever. Uh, Dial-up access was just as good as network. Uh, for accessing and compromising remote systems. Even to this day, stuff still exists on dial-up. So by this point, security takes a uh, hold in people's mind. And in some people's mind, they said, you know, I'm not a fan of these computers. So back in the 70s, we had a different type of denial of service attack. There were a few groups that said, you know, I'm not gonna crash this machine, I'm gonna burn it. I'm gonna use explosives. And they did. They broke into these companies and Arson was their denial of service. Uh, one of the groups was called Clodo. Uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce the French name, which actually gives them the acronym. Uh, yeah, you guys can figure that one out later. <coughs> so uh, moving into uh, the 70s and 80s, we also have our first taste of SCADA vulnerabilities. This is another fun one. Um, first SCADA vulnerability published in 1983. When was the next one published? 17 years later. Seems a bit odd. Um, note that while the publication was in 83, the problem had actually been around a while. Uh, so, NERC, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, they issued this in 83, basically saying that uh, certain devices might fail if certain radio transmissions occurred near them. <laughs> that doesn't sound so good. Um, let me translate that. <coughs> When the technician was in the room, and he used his walkie-talkie issued by the nuclear power plant, shit shuts down. <laughs> yeah. Okay, oh, so... Boy, scram's gone. Well, it's a few scrams among friends, yeah. Okay, so, um... The first time was in, uh, the Farley plant in Alabama. They figured out a differential relay type 12 STD. Yeah. Uh, 15B5A is... Radio frequency sensitive. <laughs> yeah, walkie talkie. Okay. Second example uh, Sequoia uh, nuclear plant in Tennessee, May of 79. Third example Three Mile Island, February 82. Uh, combustible gas monitors indicated they couldn't breathe. They disagreed. They figured out their walkie talkies were messing with those too. Uh, fourth example Grand Gulf of Mississippi in July of 83. Shut down cooling loop lost for 30 minutes. So what's scary here is that a walkie-talkie does this, or it happened five times before 83, before NERC said, yeah, we should probably tell people about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so anyway, that's the wonderful world of SCADA back in the day. Um, time permitting, I'll go digging through more of the NERC reports and everything. And I have a feeling that in that 17 year window, there were actually more issues, but you have to kind of decode their fluffy wording. So what does the picture look like so far? We're up to the 1990s. The 1990s is the true rise of vulnerabilities. The 90s saw more mail lists like BugTrack, comprehensive uh, vulnerability databases like ISS X-Force, and the creation of a standard for vulnerability identifiers called CVE. Uh, the 90s had 2,366 documented vulnerabilities. In reality, there's thousands more that aren't in the databases. Because there's only a single database out there that gives a shit about history, and I'm the only one working on that part of it. I'll get there. Um, so, 
This is also why I don't really like graphs for this kind of presentation, because my first inclination is to start coloring with crayons. <laughs> and when that fails, then I sort of want to take that code. Even if I lose to a chicken, that's fine. Um, so, up to 94, you primarily saw Unix-based vulnerabilities, local and remote. Uh, encryption algorithms like GDES, Snefru, Kafra, Redoc2, Loki, and Lucifer were falling. Um, again, why does encryption get all the cool names and we get stuck with stupid code names? Lion, tiger, come on. Um, so 94 hits and Pandora's box opens. <laughs> why is 94 another tipping point? Windows. Hmm? Windows. Not Windows. The web. So the web actually goes back to 91, but what happened in 94? And this is, again, kind of an arbitrary date. AOL. In 94, Netscape says, we're going to commercialize this bitch. <laughs> so we have the commercial web in 94, basically. Um, and before that, that's the first web server ever. <laughs> Do not power this off, yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, the commercialization of the web and more rapid deployment, it became kind of an eternal fountain of web-based vulnerabilities. And over the next 15 years, we'd see uh, the vulnerability counts jump consistently. Um, yeah, so I covered the 94 bit. Okay, so uh, turn of the century, changing landscape. Vulnerability research and disclosure both matured greatly but we also saw a steady stream of crap. And by that, I mean these vulnerability disclosures that have no good details or whatever, and it just went up and up and up. Now, the downside is the people who track vulnerabilities, we have to go through all these reports. We have to try to figure out, wait a minute, this guy didn't even put a product name or a script name. He just said, paste this code in this field. Yeah, so these convoluted reports become very problematic. Um, 2006 is when we saw the great spike of cross-site scripting and SQL injection. That's when every little kitty had decided, wow, I can paste script code or a back tick into a box. I'm a hacker. Yeah, and we caught the brunt of that one. We started to get so many bad reports that uh, OSVDB, the database that I'm the content manager of, we have a category called myth slash fake. So we have to flag these entries as bullshit, basically. Uh, we currently have 436 flag like that. Honestly, if we had more time, that number would probably be up in the two, three, five, ten thousand range if we could actually verify them. Um, so yeah. <laughs> I jumped the gun on that one. So yeah, the security researcher, uh, like I said, disclosures, no URL, no version, no script name, but they were a researcher. And they say so on the resume. Um, we all know about computer systems that we use, laptops, everything, but how about some of the more interesting ones? Uh, vulnerabilities in, I don't know, stuff that actually impacts us in the long term, like electronic voting, uh, premier electric, uh, election systems, known as Debolt, yeah, uh, Heart, election systems and software, Sequoia, and Digivote. It's basically every single one out there that makes electronic voting machines. Yeah, they kind of have uh, a lot of vulnerabilities. These are remote, these are local, these are physical, they're everything from having no tamper evidence seals on the thing, so that when you're in there with a little screen around you, you kind of open the thing, plug in a USB, and there you go, you just control the election. And it really is that simple. I mean, I don't mean to alarm anyone, but it is that bad. Um, there's some very, very cool papers, a little hard to read, but if you find the right ones, at the end they kind of do, what if? If our team had eight more minutes and, I don't know, seven bucks. Yeah, we could control the entire election. Neat stuff. Uh, keyless Entry systems in the cars, yeah, those go back to uh, 2004. The BMW was the first one. Uh, someone figured out how to, to get past that, and then they said, wait a minute, let's monetize this bitch. So they actually made these boxes and sold them, so anyone could steal a BMW. Yeah. Uh, who likes motorcycles? What is that? Ducati, yeah. Uh, if you look up here, it's got a little keypad. Yeah, if you know the right default four-digit pin, you start the thing. <laughs> okay, um, medical, we don't really care about that, right? The scary part of this picture, is that's from 85. I'm going to jump back. In 85, the Therac 25, it had a very small race condition that might have potentially given you a lethal dose of radiation. Read the fine print between the lines. Everything suggests that, yeah, someone could have affected that if they wanted to. And medical is starting to get popular again. 
So that brings us to this decade. We're seeing the same thing. Everything we've seen, all the old classics that we love. Um, there's new exciting devices because our lives are filled with gadgets, but the vulnerabilities are just the same. 2011 and later is really when the bug bounty programs kicked in. They became more popular. Um, several bounties have been operating for many years, obviously, uh, but more and more companies said, wait a minute, we can pay a thousand, 2,500 bucks and get, I don't know, conservatively $20,000 worth of consulting from this guy? Let's do it. You know? And it really is. It's a great program. It also encourages the people to take their vulnerabilities directly to the vendor to get fixed, rather than uh, maybe 3000 on the black market. So, if I had a nickel for every vulnerability ever disclosed, I'd have a shitload of nickels. <laughs> In reality, our database will hit the 100,000 mark on catalog vulnerabilities by the end of the year. Or we'll be very close. I actually have a bet with one of our, not competitors, but kind of, saying that we'll hit 100,000 by then. We only have to kick out 37 a day for the rest of the year. Our daily average is 35. Every day, 35 new vulnerabilities. On a good day, we push out 120. 120 a day. How many do you read about in the news? One or two spectacular hacks? Yeah. So, what lessons have we learned in the last 111 years? Uh, repeatedly, hardware and software is vulnerable. Clear text transmissions from 1902. Crypto failure from 39. Trusting user input since 55. Race conditions, 56. Overflows, 83. Format strings, 98. SQL injection, 98. Cross-site scripting, 99. Shouldn't we have learned our lesson by now? Yep, what do we do every day? Release more shitty code with those same vulnerabilities over and over. Why? <laughs> <laughs> because we're not, un or we're not addressing the underlying problem. You know, instead, we say, band-aids. We're going to patch this little code. We're going to patch this code. How often do you get Microsoft patches? Microsoft Tuesday, right before Exploit Wednesday. How often, yeah. How often do you get uh, Oracle patches? Every three months, it's a big improvement. Uh, Cisco, whenever the fuck they want. Why do you have the support contract? And that's the only way you find out fix information for some of those Cisco advisories. You know, the ones they don't post to any of the other public sources? Yeah, it's miserable. Um, so yeah, instead of fixing the issues at the root, um, new, exciting, and profitable ways to fix the problem. So you get blinky lights, and you get colorful buzzwords. Will your cloud-based DLP protect you from the BYOD threat or be a stomping ground for the latest APT? Oh my. Yes. <laughs> if I had a drink, I would be drunk off that. But that's what we get. That's what the news pushes. That's what the vendors push. And as a result, even some of the researchers that are getting big paychecks to find this stuff, their marketing department says, oh, <laughs> you're going to use that buzzword, trust me. So, that makes our industry kind of like these guys. We are about as productive. Uh, we treat <laughs> symptoms. We don't cure the disease. We go to security conferences. We preach to the choir. Irony, yeah. Uh, talking about the next best thing and magical solutions. Uh, but solutions are lost in the echo chamber. And for the record, you guys, like I said, are my guinea pigs. I'm doing this talk at a community college next week, and then a different college the week after, trying to break out of the security group. Let's talk to the new young people. Let's try to educate them before, you know, the cycle repeats itself. Huh? Oh, if you're not cynical, you're not doing your job. Yeah, not us. Oh, yeah. I don't make them cynical, but I also kind of encourage them and say, by the way, you can make big money if you fix this. <laughs> Actually fix it. So yeah, we spend countless hours debating full disclosure and how much time to give the vendors to fix a reported vulnerability. Uh, yeah, these are the same vendors that drag their feet and take as many as three years to fix, I don't know, cross-site scripting. Yeah, sanitizing input is difficult. Even after the issue is disclosed, they can sometimes take years. So the age-old question, how do we fix this? Firstly, I'm more of a breaker than a builder. Hey, how did you get in my network closet? <laughs> <laughs> you left it on lock. One two, three, one, two, three, four. So uh, this isn't exactly my brand of cola on the fixing side. Um, there's smart vendors out there with industry leading whatever. Uh, shouldn't they be fixing the problem? How many of you held your vendor accountable for fixing something? 
Not patching. Root cause fixing. How many of you had luck doing it? Liar. <laughs> um, so, all I can offer is perspective. Small dose of reality. <coughs> 111 years, we've seen the same thing over and over. What is it going to take to fix it? I don't know. Uh, probably even worse by then. Vulnerability database will have, you know, 500,000 issues or whatever. So, anyway, that's it. Do you have any questions? So, Fred Brooks published the Mythical Man Month in 1975, looking at software engineering and development of software. He pretty categorically laid out the fact that whenever you develop software of significant size, you're going to have bugs. So, I think the industry, in terms of the people producing this stuff, have known for, you know, what, like over 30 years, that it's impossible to produce software without vulnerabilities. And so, I think asking people, what are we going to do to fix this, might be a rhetorical question at this point, because the people actually building this software have already accepted we're going to have bugs. We just need to minimize the cost of putting those bugs into our software. Not eliminate them, just reduce costs so we can still make profit, right? Because they're a profit point. That's a great point. And two things. Number one, how did the computer system go 17 years out without any vulnerabilities being disclosed? Is their code good? No one looking at it? A little of both? I don't know. Um, number two, yeah. This has been brought up over and over. Uh, how do we fix it? There are going to be bugs. And if we know there are going to be bugs, why do we have news articles saying there are bugs? Why is that news? Why do we have vendors saying, oh, there's, there's vulnerabilities, you need to patch them? Oh, we know that, right? So one reason or another, we know it, kind of accept it. Do you want to use the software? Yeah, I think people make that ROI decision, right? I, like, I don't, I don't want to use this lucky thing. I, I think that, that's a, a bad term to use, because I, I don't think the ROI decision really factors in. No one's sitting there with a pen and paper going, well, oh, return on investments, this and that. They're like, ooh, blinky lights. <laughs> yeah. The problem is the users now, they don't know the ramifications of what's going to happen if that software fails, and software has been in places that it was never before. I mean, you have vehicles that have more software in it than, than the things that NASA uses. Absolutely. Like, so they didn't anticipate that their bugs could potentially cause death. Have you read about any of the, the fun car hacks? I, I covered one of the first ones. So yeah, there's an entire paper about, um, I don't think they actually gave the vendor. Uh, this team said, you know, what can we do to this car? Well, remotely they figured out how to trip the brakes for starters, and then, you know, cut out the engine and accelerate. And then they figured out, well, wait a minute, how do we really do this? Because our effective range is like, you know, 10 yards or something. So they figured out, well, wait a minute, if I go to my dealer and I plug my infected car into their diagnostic machine, Every subsequent car that gets plugged into it gets infected. How's that for an attack vector? Yeah, take your, you know, defective car into every dealer in the city, and anywhere up to a month later, how many fatalities do you have? You know, and that, that attack's just sitting out there in explicit detail, ready for someone to do. And what are we going to see happen? People are going to die on the road, and then Congress is going to go, oh, no, this is bad. No shit. And... We got to fix this. No shit. Back to this problem. And so, yeah. And again, there there is not an easy answer to any of this. I, we all know that. But there has to be something. With the most effective solution being changing the way education is done, as well as creating open source tools to help find these vulnerabilities in the source code. Yes. Yes, and halfway there. Yes, education. So the most most secure computer in the world was the number one way to get in. The human. Yeah. So if the users don't know what they're doing, they're going to click shit. Guaranteed. So to the other one, rather than having tools to find these vulnerabilities, no, that's band-aids. Why do we have programming languages that still allow you to actually code an overflow? Are there any programming languages out there that you cannot code a straight overflow in? Yeah? Why aren't all of them like that now? Why are we still using PHP, by the way? <laughs> Not only is it horrible, but there's an entire history of them basically saying, it's just remote code execution, it's cool. <laughs> well, you know the developers of PHP are on PC or something like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, they're they're hitting it good. <laughs> so, so there are formal methodologies and formal standards for developing 
developing software in places like hospitals or NASA or no. microcontrollers? No. Well, there are formal standards of, in methodology. So I'll give you that much, but not in use at hospitals or NASA. Well, they're supposed to follow them. Right. And, and like, like there, are, there are federal regulations. <laughs> <laughs> but the problem is, if you follow those formalized methods to make provably safer software, the cost of producing that software will increase exponentially. And so I think proposing like a solution, like we have to fix this, we would also have to accept much greater cost in terms of our QA, software dev, testing cycles. Don't we do that in other parts of our life? How many taxes do you pay for that bridge so it's safe? It's true, but I'm also used to my, like, you know, $199 iPhone when I have my contract. How much did you pay for your car? Enough? Yeah. Yeah, why? How much safety testing went into it, and how much is cost shifting to you? It's true, but if the cost of my car suddenly went from, like, 20000 to, like, 55000 No, 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 my point is that they've already done that. They've already cost shifted to you, and now we all go buy cars. It's just part of our life. We accept those prices. We know that the actual materials and the time to develop that are not... Thirty, fifty, eighty thousand dollars, especially the higher you get. But is somebody going to buy a twelve hundred dollars safe iPhone versus the four hundred dollars? Government does. <laughs> yeah. How many people do you know using Blackberries that aren't government agents? Yeah, not many. So yeah, it's just one of those things, you know. And even back in the day, there were all these standards for um, secure systems. God, what was it? Was it letters or numbers? C two, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What happened to those? What happened to those? Why are those standards gone? Because those systems were... We got irresponsible. Even the people in this room, we are personally responsible for doing... Apathy. When do we want it? I don't care. <laughs> yeah. The government went to COT Solutions because they didn't want to pay to develop the technology because it was a limited market, marketplace and it became cheaper to adopt commercials off the shelf. Exactly. And now what do we see every day? Blah, 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 agency hacked. Every time. Could you speak or, up a bit? Yeah, I think the only references we're able to make as far as, you know, standardizing the cars, you know, yeah, you know, you can't buy a car that doesn't meet the safety regulations in the U.S., but the only answer to that is the, you know, U.S. mandating and putting standards for it. So, advocate getting that tied up in order to solve it. That's the only example I can think of where that could be solved. So, yeah, I've spent an obscene amount of time the past three months chatting with a lawyer about what are our options for mandating this? Can, can it be done reasonably? without the government either stepping on their own dick or stepping on ours, because that's all they're good at, right? So can it be done? Uh, maybe. Um, is it going to take a radical shift in the government thinking? Yes. Have we seen it recently? Yes. So there's a little hope out there. Yes? On one hand, you say yes. So 2006, big rise of cross-site scripting and SQL injection. I covered why. Everyone figured out I can cut and paste code. I can see an error message. I can report it. I'm probably right. You know, cross-site scripting. A lot of them reported today. They require admin credentials. They require a post request. And sometimes they require a cross-site uh, request forgery on top of it. So it's becoming very difficult to exploit them in some cases. But they're still being reported. Does that trend say anything about, well, we should spend money there? Well, the market said so. The market said, yeah, we're going to do web application firewalls. We all know how good they are, right? You know, they stop just about nothing. And in reality, were those problems already there? Yes. Uh, how many format strings? And actually, uh, Steve Christie uh, with CDE and myself, we did a presentation at Black Hat. The slides are online. I can give you a URL later. In that, we, we go through a lot more of the statistical side of vulnerabilities, but one of the things we showed is how a single researcher can do an incredible spike in the disclosure of a single type of vulnerability. So there was this one guy who said, I'm going to find format strings, because no one else was finding them, even though they go back so far. People are like, oh, it's just, you know, it's not fun, it's boring, it's not exciting, whatever. But oh, no, he did. And so he found a ton of them. That tells us that, yes, they are there. Now, because he found them, do we need to throw money at them that day? Not really. We needed to throw the money long before that. 
So instead of saying, instead of reacting to, to the vulnerability disclosure trends, we need to react to the underlying problem. When you break it down to a taxonomy of the different kinds of vulnerabilities, you don't have many categories. You know, you have author, or authentication, you have input sanitization. Input manipulation, there's your number one vulnerability. All of that boils down to one thing, don't trust user input. And these companies are like, oh, we're not going to trust user input. We're going to put this fancy JavaScript routine on the browser to handle that. <sighs> yeah, we know where that goes. So it's more or less about not only fixing the problem, but also doing it in the right places. You, you had made a uh, comment about uh, mandates or things that we should touch. Sometimes the organizations, whether it's the government or the agency that's part of it, makes things uh, a plus that are vulnerable. I mean, I take, I, I take uh, offense to the fact that you now no longer have the cartridge monitors or the old magnetic ones. They're all Bluetooth enabled. Right. With a known vulnerability in that Bluetooth enabled. Vulnerability is plural, sir. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm focused on one. I've yep. done the yep. one. But yeah, the, the fact is, like, they made it mandatory to have that. Right. You have your electronic control unit in the vehicle, which is obviously vulnerable. Uh, you have multiple things that, that are making the, the mobile node more vulnerable. The ECU is the like the, the core where all the vulnerabilities are, yes. and the only saving grace is that a lot of people disclosing those vulnerabilities aren't given to manufacturers, or they're not telling you what cars they're in or whatever. But no, you're right. And so yeah, they're mandating safety on one hand, but they're not considering the the computer security and the software side of it. Yeah, they need to be educated on that. And again, what has history shown us? We need death. We need mayhem, chaos. Then they actually might. <laughs> eh, okay, we'll get to that. And the cost has now gone from 10 grand 20 years ago for a car to 30. Right. Yes. And of course, as soon as they put in these new regulations, now what does the car industry do? <laughs> We're going to pass this right back to you tenfold. And of course, all these different wireless vectors of communication, Bluetooth, uh, unlock devices, everything else, that's all going through the ECU, so that's just another tax bracket. Correct. <laughs> oh, and how about these lovely cars that built in Wi Fi? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Because we didn't have enough wireless vectors. Oh, let's give us one with better range. Yeah. So do you think maybe litigation or lawsuits could potentially solve for like mass death in terms Close. of making somebody pay attention? Close. And again, like I said, been talking to a lawyer. The FTC recently fined someone, or they fined them or they just said, no, you can't advertise. They, they fined them and said, you can't call your product secure anymore, or we're going to keep fining you. That's where we need to go. So it's not so much pure litigation. We need the government to step in and say, you're lying to us. We know it. Here's the proof. Don't do it again, or we're going to bankrupt you. That will get companies to change. So that's a, we're at the, the first step of a very big staircase there, though. But it is heading in the right direction, I think. Uh, I think that's probably all my time. But I will be out in the hall if anyone has any other questions, discussions, or anything. <laughs>